much cooling? Well, a guy named Larry Williams did a computer model study where he, um, he wanted to find out, uh, he wanted to keep one, at least one inch of snow over the summer into the early fall, one inch. And he wanted to know what temperature fall was needed for the summer in Canada to produce that one inch of snow. And he decreased his model by increments of two degrees centigrade, or that's about three degrees Fahrenheit. So by the time he got down to 10 degrees, a, a 10 degree cooler summer, it, uh, he had his one inch of snow in the early fall right in this area. Cooled off another two degrees, 12 degrees centigrade or 20 degrees Fahrenheit cooler summers in Canada. The one inch line was only right here. It melted all south of here, but the one inch was here and northward. That's 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And by the way, in his model, he helped himself because he doubled the amount of winter snowfall. So he had twice as much snowfall as you normally would have in Canada. He raised the land about 400 feet. He decreased the solar radiation to correspond to what's called a Milankovitch minimum. And he got rid of Hudson's Bay, which is, is, a, is a moderating effect. And so with all those, he still only got 20 degrees Fahrenheit. He only got it down to here. Well, the ice was way down south of the Great Lakes. So there's lots of problems. And not only that, if you can find a cooling mechanism, the cooler the air, the drier it is. For instance, this is a graph of the water carrying capacity versus temperature. Water carrying capacity, this is at saturation, you know, when you have 100% humidity and the water starts uh, condensing out. So at 10 degrees centigrade, which is the average temperature in Northeast Canada in the summertime, you go over to here, you have 10 grams per cubic meter of water that you can, you can load the atmosphere with. But if you cooled it off 12 degrees to an average of minus two, and you go over here, it's only four degrees, four grams per cubic meter. So you've uh, dried the air out uh, 60%. If you can find a cooling mechanism to go to 10 degrees centigrade to minus two, you dry the air. So you have the opposite problem. If you find a cooling mechanism, you, where's the abundant snowfall coming? And that's why there's well over 60 theories on the ice age, all of which have serious problems. But the ice occurred south of the Great Lakes. What kind of conditions do we need for our ice, say, at Minneapolis, Minnesota? Not too long ago, Minneapolis had an ice sheet probably 500 feet, 1,000 feet thick. So the average June to August temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, we have to get a cool off the summers at least to freezing, right? Oh, but we have to go below free, uh, freezing because the major melting uh, uh, parameter is solar radiation, and there's a lot of it in the summer in Minneapolis. So we have to go much lower than that. Well, Antarctica provides an example. When it warms up to 14 degrees Fahrenheit, you start getting net melting at the edge of the Antarctic ice sheet because of the solar radiation. 14 degrees. So you'd have to cool off the temperatures in the summertime, Minneapolis well below 32 degrees. Let's say it's 20 degrees, just to be conservative. That represents a summer temperature drop of 50 degrees Fahrenheit to get ice, ice developing at Minneapolis. 50 degrees Fahrenheit, do we know of any present processes that can cause a climate change like that for a whole summer at Minneapolis? And by the way, I emphasize present processes because uniformitarian scientists depend on present processes to uh, explain all past events, all the rocks and fossils and the climate of the past, including the Ice Age, has to be from present processes that we observe today. I can't think of anything that even come close to that. So as a result, the Ice Age is not a showcase for uniformitarian geologists. It's a very, very serious problem. And I'm going to just run off a bunch of quick quotes from you. J.K. Charlesworth, 1957. Pleistocene phenomenon, Pleistocene is another term for Ice Age, by the way. Ice Age phenomenon that produced an absolute riot of theories ranging from the remotely possible to the mutually contradictory and the palpably inadequate. <laughs> that is not saying too much at all, is it, for their theories? Daniel Pendick, in the popular uh, journal called Earth, it's now defunct, by the way, said this, if they hadn't actually happened, the Ice Ages would sound like science fiction. What he's saying, you know, if, if we didn't observe all this evidence around there and someone said there was an ice age, we'd say it's just science fiction because we, we don't expect ice ages. And just recently, 19, well, not that recent anymore. It was recent when I put this, this slide here. In 1997, U.S. News and World Report reported on the great science mysteries. They reported on 18 great science mysteries. Now, 
Some of these science mysteries are mysteries of their own making because they believe in evolution. For instance, can you read that first one up there? Why should males exist? <laughs> why? Well, you know something? They can't figure out why there should be a male and female in the evolutionary idea. It doesn't make any sense at all. Everything should reproduce asexually, just one sex. There should just be a female. So that's a big mystery. But you know, <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> From the biblical worldview, we have, we have answers for that easy because it says in the beginning, God made them male and female. It's almost a no-brainer. But yet, they are stuck, and they've been stuck for many years, and, many, and a number of books have been written trying to explain this. But some of them are real legitimate mysteries. One of them is what causes ice ages. Just recently, David Alt in Glacial Lake Missoula and its humongous floods. By the way, I believe there's only one Lake Missoula flood. I'll, get in, I'll talk about that a little later. Although theories about no one really knows what causes the ice age. So the ice age is a major mystery uh, according to ma from in mainstream science. Can we explain it? Can we explain it? Well, first of all, when you look at the deposits, they're on the surface of the flood rocks. You have thousands of feet of, of hard sedimentary rocks. These are surface features, nice lateral and end moraines. No flood, Genesis flood is going to produce a lateral and end moraine or something that looks like a horseshoe moraine. So obviously they're, they're after the flood. Where would we put it? Well, we'd put it in a transitional climate going from the flood to the present climate. A transitional climate caused by the flood. Yes, the flood not only deposited the rocks and the fossils, it also had an effect on the climate. Well, how? Well, how does it do it? Well, because the flood was a gigantic tectonic volcanic event. A lot of earth movements like this. A lot of uh, cracking of the earth and molten magma coming up into volcanoes. And so after the flood, you'd have all this, this shroud of volcanic ash and aerosols in the, trapped in the stratosphere uh, after, right after the flood. Now, this stuff will slowly settle out. So you need to replenish it afterwards uh, with, with uh, Ice Age volcanism, which there's a lot of it. I'll have a quote on that. So the volcanic dust and aerosols cause the cooler summers over the land. They don't affect the ocean very much because of its high heat capacity and its circulation to circulate the warm water. Also, the fountains of the great deep and volcanism cause the, uh, the ocean after the flood to be warm. 